Hello everyone! This is not where I wanted to record today and not even the time when I wanted to record. I would have liked to record this video at night because we are working now on a small booklet about prayer at night and I wanted to discuss certain aspects of prayer at night with all of you. But I woke up last night, as I often do lately, with a horrible migraine and um, there was no way I could have done any work. So I had to postpone recording until today. And then this morning I realized that what had happened last night was in fact the perfect beginning for this small series of recordings on prayer at night. You see, lately, for the last eight months or nine months or so, I have almost daily migraines and I often get caught up in my room and migraines simply prohibit me from leaving my room. And we've just gone through a pandemic that has kept many of us inside our rooms and it is a possibility that uh, those lockdowns will come back to us and we'll have to re-experience that feeling of being closed inside and not being able to communicate with the outside world. And often also many of us, all of us at some point or another in our lives, simply due to illness or weakness or just sadness, are unable to leave our beds or our rooms and we just lie down all alone. And it is a very tempting thought that these alone times, these moments when we are stuck inside, are moments which are wasted somehow in our spiritual growth, when in fact these are the moments we should look upon with great courage and great hope because these are the opportunities for all of us to go back to the very beginning of real growth in our spiritual life, to go back to the basics, the foundation of our spiritual life. Saint John of the Ladder, the wonderful teacher for monastics and all Christians concerning the spiritual life and our growth from one virtue to another, Saint John of the Ladder defines aloneness, defines separation from the world, our being stuck somewhere apart from the world, as the very first step on which we have to climb in order to begin our real growth. Real growth, according to Saint John of the Ladder, begins with separation from the world. And it is tempting to think that Saint John was only speaking for monastics, and indeed he was addressing specifically monastics, but his teaching, the essence of his teaching, is applicable to all Christians, no matter of the sort of life that they live. He speaks to monastics because he was a monastic himself and because those were the people he was concerned with. But growth follows more or less the same pattern for all of us. And separation from the world applies to married people or people who are single in the world as much as for monastics. A hermit will leave the world behind by going to leave his life in the desert or in a place where there is no one else. A monastic will leave the world behind by closing himself or herself in within the walls of his or her monastery. A married person will leave the world behind by dedicating himself or herself exclusively to the person with whom they are married now. A person who is single in the world will leave the world by assuming this state of being single as their cross, their 
offering before the Lord and by separating themselves from the idea of marriage or the idea of a monastic community. These are our vows before God. We define before God where is our aloneness and what constitutes our world and then we leave the world behind in order to be alone with him, alone with him in our desert, in our monastery, in our marriage or in our single life. This is only the beginning. This separation from the world simply marks the beginning of our spiritual growth. And every time I find myself caught in my room because of a migraine, and every time we go through a situation such as this pandemic and the lockdown that followed, we could look at this if we are willing to see the positive in things and if we are willing to constantly grow in our spiritual life. We can look at this as an opportunity to go back to the beginning, to go back to that foundation of all spiritual growth, our separation from the world and our focus on who we are before Christ our God. This advice of separating ourselves from the world is particularly, particularly important for our generation because, because of this story. There is a story that one of the disciples of one of the holy elders of the desert failed to do anything good. And he ended up going to the elder and confessed to the elder that he cannot do anything. When the elder would advise him to pray, the poor disciple answered, I cannot pray. I try, but I cannot pray. If you cannot pray, the Abba said, then at least keep vigil at night. And the disciple said, I cannot keep vigil either. So the elder would say, if you cannot pray and you cannot keep vigil, then at least fast. And the disciple would say, I cannot even fast, elder. So eventually the elder answered him, and I think his answer applies to us perfectly today. If you cannot fast, if you cannot do prostrations, if you cannot keep vigil, if you cannot pray, then go into your cell, lock the door behind you and stay inside and your cell will teach you everything. And it may seem different from what St. John of the Ladder has taught us, but staying inside, keeping yourself with everything that you are as a complex human being inside your cell is the same as leaving the world behind. And they both, in fact, are reduced to keeping oneself in the reality of life, keeping yourself real in the reality of the given context of your life. If you are married, then your cell is your family and you have to keep yourself with everything that you are, your body and your mind and your words and your heart within your family. If you are a monastic, then your cell is your cell, your actual monastery, with those people who live there with you, your brothers and your sisters in the monastic life. If you are a single person, your cell, your monastery, is the church and your friends. This is the vow that we make before him, the tool we give him so he can work our salvation. We are the ones who define and decide what this saving tool is. If you are married and you keep yourself within the confinement 
of your sacrament, the confinement of your cell, your marriage, then Christ will know that he can use your marriage with its joys and its accomplishments as well as with its difficulties and its sadness to work everything that is necessary for your salvation and similarly for a single person or a monastic person. These are our monasteries, these are our cells and we need to keep ourselves in the reality of that present, of those people and of the behaviours that we encounter. This is in fact a battle to keep our minds and our hearts within the reality that is before our eyes and away separated from the world of a fantasy world which we create ourselves based on our past and its experiences. All of this may sound theoretical, all of this may sound like it's lacking any sort of practical importance, but Trust St. John of the Ladder and trust the elders of the Egyptian desert, separating ourselves from the fantasy world of our past and grounding our life in the reality of the here and now, the cell of our monastery, single life or marriage, is the beginning and the condition, the absolute condition for real growth in the spiritual life. Let me give you a few examples and maybe that will help us understand why this is absolutely vital. In a marriage, for instance, when your spouse, your wife, for example, says something that hurts you and then you get trapped in this never ending circle of remembering those words and getting angry and then remembering those words with the weight of your new anger which makes them sound even worse and then you get even more angry and then you remember them again and they become increasingly annoying and increasingly hurtful and every time you remember them you accumulate more and more anger it is worth remembering that you are interacting with a person who is real. This is your wife. This is the person whom you loved enough to make a vow before God that you would spend your entire life with this person, that you would become one with this person before God. This is not a previous person with whom you've had a previous relationship. The hurt that she has made you feel has nothing to do with the echoes of the hurt which other people from your past have made you feel. If you keep your mind and you bring your emotions within the confinement, the limits of your cell, of the reality of your life, the reality of your marriage, and if you remember simply those words, as they were said, not as you hear them now, being influenced by your past emotions and your past traumas, if you just look at the reality of that behavior, the reality of those words, and the reality of this particular human being whom you loved so much that you gave yourself to her before God, then within the reality of that small space and without the influences of your past fantasy world, you will discover that nothing is as hurtful or as traumatic as it sounded only a few minutes before. And the same applies to monastic life. Very frequently people who have lived more in the world and who have accumulated a lot of experience either by being married before or having tried to live in 
other monasteries before they join a particular community, or simply people who go into a monastery later in their lives, they've accumulated so much experience that everything that they hear, every behavior that they encounter, every person with whom they interact, is in fact so much more than those words, that behavior, and that person. Because every word that you hear has an entire bibliography behind it. Every behavior that you encounter has an entire bibliography of references from your past. These references being nothing else but your past experiences. And so, although the person in front of you, your monastic brother or your monastic sister or your friend or your spouse, has no intention to hurt you, maybe they've just said something that sounded hurtful because you are going through a bad mood that particular moment, or maybe they are going through a bad mood that particular moment, or maybe it was just the way that both of you interacted that morning. It doesn't matter. The point is that instead of interacting with the reality of your cell, the simple, naked reality of that person, those words, that behavior within the reality of your cell, you have allowed your mind to access the outside world. You have allowed your mind to access this deep, endless bibliography of past traumas and past experiences which inform now, I'd better say deform now, the reality of your life. And I say deform because even what we call the wisdom of our past experiences, things we learn based on our past, even that is not much more than fantasy, because we rewrite our past. We constantly, unwillingly, without knowing most of the time, we reassess what happened. We renegotiate what that person has said and how he answered. And in doing that, we rewrite our past. We learn from a past that actually was never real. Instead of interacting with the practical, real, realness of our cell, instead of keeping ourselves within the walls of our monastery, our friendships, our church, and our marriage, our minds interact and react to our past, which is all fake all rewritten in a way that serves us best. If you think about a temptation, to give you another example, if you think about the way in which many of us react to a temptation, if you think about anger, because we've used anger before, but you can think about anything else, lust or greed or any other temptation, if you think about the way in which we are tempted, and then we get to a point where we recognize a pattern, and we know, oh, this has happened not once before, not ten times before, but hundreds of times before, and every time I got to this point, I failed. And that's the moment when you've actually abandoned. That's the moment when you've just allowed the enemy, you've allowed that temptation to take over you. And you've done that because of the same thing. Because instead of keeping yourself grounded as a soldier of Christ, fighting till the last breath against that particular temptation, you've allowed this reality of the temptation of the here and now to disappear, and instead of fighting in the here and now, you've allowed the fantasy world of your past to take over and to defeat you. And we do that, of course, because it's so much more comfortable than to keep on fighting every time. It's so much more comfortable, but it is, in fact, a 
tragedy. It is a tragedy for at least two reasons. First, abandoning the reality of yourself and allowing yourself, allowing your feelings and your mind and your body to respond to the fantasy world of your past, of the outside world, is to fail to do anything real. Because the people with whom you interact now, although they are made of flesh and bones, in your mind and in your heart, they are no longer those real people. They are the fantasy people which your past has shaped for you. You no longer respond to the reality of that spouse of yours or that brother or sister in the monastic life of yours. You respond to a human being which was created in your mind and that is a tragedy because it is so much easier to hate, to judge, to condemn and to reject a fantasy being than the reality of your spouse and of your brother. And even more tragic than this is the fact that when we begin to act that way, we allow our past, we allow the world, these fantasies which we have created, we allow them to act as the lens through which we perceive the world. We allow this fantasy world and its virtues, which are all false because we have created them, we have rewritten them, but we allow them to be the judges of our current real life. And we end up judging and condemning people based on the criteria of a fantasy world, instead of seeing them for who they are. And you know why this is the greatest tragedy of all? Because that is idolatry. That is the moment when instead of allowing Christ to step in in the reality of our present and instead of allowing him to be the lens through which we perceive the world and the people within ourselves, we allow our past we allow the inventions, the false criteria, the false virtues, the false idols which we created from the outside world, from our past, to be these lances. And instead of responding according to the commandments of the reality of Christ, which is never to judge always to love, to put yourself on a cross in order to save yourself and every single other human being ever created. We allow these idols of ours to judge the world and to condemn the world. And we end up thinking that we serve God while we butcher our neighbor. We end up believing that we serve Christ, who is God, God who is love, when in fact we butcher spiritually and sometimes physically our brothers and our sisters. The beginning of any growth in our spiritual life, the beginning of our spiritual life per se, is to leave the world behind and to stay in our cell. If you cannot pray, stay in your cell and your cell, the reality of your life will teach you how to pray. The reality of your marriage or your single life or your monastic life will teach you how to pray, how to really pray. If you cannot fast, stay in your cell, forget all about your past, forget all about the fantasies of that outside world of 
Not the now and not the here, the then and the there. Stay in the here, stay in the now. And the pain that you see in the real people in the here and the now of your life, that pain, that sin that you will perceive in them will teach you how to fast for them. The love which Christ will inspire your heart here and now to feel, will teach you, will force you to fast, will teach you, will force you to pray and to keep vigil, because your heart will have no rest as long as you perceive a drop of pain in this reality of your soul. Don't allow the fantasy of a world which we imagine by projecting, projecting the experiences of our past onto the reality of our present. Don't allow that fantasy world to compromise our only hope of salvation, which is to be real and present in the reality of your soul whatever that cell may be. I wanted to record this at night time because I wanted to start working on our booklet on prayer by night. But I couldn't because of my migraine. But in a way, this has also been a blessing and an opportunity because this is the beginning of that booklet. There is no way you can engage with real prayer until you engage with your real self, alive, existing in the reality of your real soul. May God bless every pore of your hearts and of your bodies dear ones, and may we all be saved by the prayer of all the saints and of the Theotokos. Amen.